Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Basics of Home Canning Virtual Workshop. This is put on in a coordination between the City of Federal Way, South King Tool Library, and Tilth Alliance. And we also wanted to give special thanks to our sponsors. Um, so the City of Federal Way is paying for this with grant funding from the King County Solid Waste Division and the Hazardous Waste Program in King County, and then uh, with special coordination and support from the South King Tool Library. My name is Jeanette Brizendine. I'm the Recycling Project Manager for the City of Federal Way, and um, I'm very excited to have everybody in this class. Um, we are working on food preservation in the Solid Waste and Recycling Division we work on both recycling and reducing waste and reducing food waste is huge right now. We have about 40% of the produce that is grown in this country does not get consumed and is thrown away. So we're hoping that in this class, you will learn how to preserve food so that instead of throwing it away, um, you can eat it later. So that we get a lot of delicious seasonal food here in the Northwest. Hopefully you can can it eat those delicious things later and not let that food go to waste and hopefully save some money in the meantime. I'd like to turn it over to my wonderful co-host Amanda Miller from the South King Tool Library so she can tell a little bit about herself and her organization and then we'll turn it over to our speaker. Awesome, thank you guys. A um, Couple more people. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Oh, that's me over there. Um, I am the executive director of the South King Tool Library. I um, am really happy to be joining you guys. I'm really excited to learn more about canning actually <laughs> and to, to participate and uh, uh, share with you in the community. So the tool library um, is like a regular library except we lend out tools instead of books. Um, we have some food preservation um, equipment but not a whole lot of canning supplies yet. Um, so. We do have plenty to help nurture and, and grow or start your garden. Um, it's not too late even now. Uh, and we just are really grateful for the City of Federal Way to the community. Um, uh, please be sure to check our website, southkingtools.org. Uh, we just launched a whole new thing. And we are the uh, 2021 recipients of the Green Globe Award uh, for King County. Uh, leaders in waste reduction because we do a bunch of crazy things besides just lending tools and helping classes like this. Uh, we try to uh, encourage repair, reducing consumption, uh, reducing waste, of course, um, things like our clothing swap coming up this weekend as well. So lots of stuff going on. I'm not going to waste your time though. We have a lot to learn. Carrie, you have a loaded agenda here. So uh, take it away. I think there's one more slide for me with the the rain garden which we do that's an old picture so there's crazy amounts of new growth there and i'm gonna have to update you but uh yeah for now <laughs> thanks guys okay should i just start um so hi i'm gonna maybe i'm gonna just stop share really quickly oh well you can see me in my corner there um, my name is Carrie. I'm wearing a yellow shirt and I'm waving. Um, and I uh, work with Tilt Alliance and um, the organization that I work for Tilt Alliance, uh, we do a lot of work around trying to um, engage people in uh, participating in our local food system. So that's um, programs from everything from um, sharing how to like grow food in your backyard, food preservation um, uh, for you know, regular folks to um, doing uh, like uh, supporting peer-to-peer -peer education between local farmers. Um, we have programs that encourage uh, a connection between local farmers and consumers. So, um, and uh, programs around engaging people in caring for and stewarding our water and soil. And if you're interested in other programs that we do, um, you're welcome to come to the website is tiltalliance.org and um, see what other kinds of programs we offer. Uh, I, my name is Carrie, and I have been um, teaching food preservation for 
about 10 years. Um, and I, I've been canning for uh, longer than that, probably 15 or 20 years. And um, But I also do a lot of other kinds of food preservation. And so um, because of the short, uh, the short time frame for this workshop, uh, what, what I was really hoping to do is um, do, a, do a little bit of like demystifying of canning. And I'm not sure how many folks out there have done canning before, but there is a little bit of science, I think, that can help us to feel less afraid of, um, of, of canning um, because it is uh, relative to other food preservation techniques. Um, it is sort of a, a new technology in the sense it's only been around for a hundred years or so. Um, but uh, but there is, uh, there is a, a, a little bit of danger that can happen. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that danger, but maybe I'll just uh, start with um, a kind of a wider view of like how um, as humans, like since the beginning of time, we have um, you know, gathered food and then tried to, uh, and then tried to keep that uh, food that we've gathered um, for, for as long as possible. And then as agriculture um, you know, developed, we then need to, to find um, more ways to be able to preserve foods for longer. And um, some newer technology like refrigeration and freezer, like those are, those are things that we, food preservation you know, techniques that we use every day without even really thinking that they're food preservation. But every time you take, you get bring carrots or um, apples home from the store and put them in your refrigerator, um, you know, or you make a double batch of soup and like put half of it into the freezer, um, you're doing some food preservation. Um, dr drying food, like uh, dehydrating and fermentation tend to be kind of older technologies. Um, those drying food um, has been around for a really long time in human history. I think also fermentation to an extent has been around for a very long time um, in human history. But, um, and the reason that, and, and also uh, techniques like using sugar or salt or acidity or smoke um, to flavor foods, but also to kind of keep them um, usable uh, for longer periods of time, I think. Um, uh, I just wanted to kind of put a wider frame around it because, um, you know, canning is a really good um, technique to know and it can be really useful, but sometimes it can be just as easy to um, put something up in the freezer or, um, you know, if you have like a huge load of tomatoes coming from your garden or you buy a case of tomatoes from the market, um, you can put some in the freezer, you can can some, you can dry some. So kind of uh, uh, diversifying your uh, food preservation techniques, I think can be helpful. Um, uh, another sort of broader look at uh, what, what we're doing with food preservation is based is uh, a lot of it is trying to control microbial growth. So we're trying to keep food from rotting. Um, and ways that we do that is by controlling factors like um, acidity, um, like temperature, like oxygen um, and moisture. And so what microbes um, need to live, this is a list of things that microbes need to live. Obviously they need to eat the food. Um, some microbes can, can live in very acidic conditions and some cannot. Um, microbes like bacteria and mold grow over time. And so that's why keeping something on the counter will be good for a short period of time, but maybe for longer, not quite so much. Um, and then when we start talking about canning, we're going to be um, really talking about using like temperature. What we're doing is, is heat processing the food. So that's going to, um, as it heats up the food, it's gonna kill a lot of the bacteria and molds um, that are in that food. And that's gonna help preserve it for longer. Um, we're also gonna be, when we're canning, we're, um, we're sealing it off from extra oxygen. And so that is also going to kind of help uh, keep our food from spoiling as well. Um, in canning, and we'll see this later when we delve a little bit more into the science, we also are using acidity to, um, to control some of those food pathogens. So um, let's see. And I guess to start off with, there's two kind of major, uh, there's two ways that we do canning. Um, one, the, the photo on your left there is the, uh, is what the, the look, a look at the inside of a water bath canner which is basically a stock pot um, that's gonna be filled with water with a rack at the bottom that you're gonna put your jars in. Um, they will be, in this picture, they're just empty jars that are heating up, but 
you'll put your um, food, your jars that are full of food into the boiling water and, um, and boil it. And then the image that's there up on the, um, on the right side of is a is a pressure canner. And so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about why there are two different ways to can and what's the difference and how do we decide. Um, and maybe I'll just before I go any further, are there any are there any questions? Um, I know uh, Jeanette and Amanda just that said we they were, yeah, we were going to um, make sure that we're going to send the slideshow out after, right? Yeah. Oh, oh great. Wonderful. For anyone who has registered with me, Jeanette, at the city, I can email it out to you. If you have not registered for the class and want to get the slideshow, um, then all I need you to do is shoot me an email or a text. My information will be up there um, and it's also in the chat. So we'll get you on that list. Thanks, everyone. Cool. Um, excellent. So I, I'm going to, um, with canning, because often people are a little nervous or um, can be afraid of canning. And, uh, and one of the main reasons that people are fearful of canning, aside from there being boiling water and sometimes like high pressure systems, um, often what people are afraid of is botulism. So I just have two slides. They have a lot of words on them, um, but I, uh, I don't know how other other way to get the information across, but I'm actually just gonna I'm gonna read the slides to you and then um, uh, so uh, why is canning so scary? Um, so botulism is caused by a microbe called Clostridium botulinum, and this is a microbe that is fairly common in our Pacific Northwest soils, um, but it exists as a dormant endospore. Am I back? Okay. Um, so uh, the botulinum uh, bacteria is fairly common in our um, in our in our Pacific Northwest soils, and it is uh, it it's as an endospore, it's dormant and it's it's harmless. But when we put that spore into optimal conditions for growth. Um, those spores will emerge into vegetative cells. And so basically, if you imagine, uh, like a metaphor would be when you plant a seed, like, you know, a seed lives in a seed packet, it's dormant. When you put the seed in the soil and the soil warms up and you water it, it gets, it, it moistens, um, that triggers that seed into um, sprouting, right? Or germinating. And so it would be similar with this. Um, of course, bacteria are not the same thing as plants, but when they're put in those optimal conditions, um, those uh, spores will, um, will emerge into a vegetative cell. And the vegetative cells are actually what create the, the toxin that causes botulism. And, um, and, and, and why it's so scary is it's not, it's not very common. Botulism poisoning is, is pretty uncommon actually, but, um, but, the, but the botulinum poison is deadly in even very small amounts and it can be uh, very quick to, um, to take over a person's, uh, you know, nervous system, and it can be, it can be a, a pretty awful illness and very quickly deadly. So, um, and that's why we are nervous about it. It's not because people contract botulism very often, but mostly it's just because it can be, it can be very deadly. And so, um, how do we avoid botulism when we're canning? Um, the way that we avoid it is to know what those optimal conditions for growth are. So um, the conditions that will make a botulinum spore emerge into a vegetative cell and become dangerous are temperatures 40 degrees and above. So what that means is outside of the refrigerator, right? At room temperature, anaerobic. Uh, anaerobic means that there's no oxygen. So when we are canning, we're sealing up a jar and canning it. We're basically sealing off the oxygen. We're creating an anaerobic environment. Um, you know, moist. So it's, you know, usually when we can food, it's liquid food, it's uh, moist food that we're canning. Um, and then low acid. So low acid things would be like uh, if we're canning vegetables or if we're canning um, potatoes or soups. And, um, and so that would be the condition where it can, you know, those low acid foods are actually, uh, when we can 
low acid foods, those are the conditions that could potentially be dangerous um, because spores that are inside the jar could potentially uh, emerge into a vegetative cell. And the spores are can only be killed by very high temperatures, at least 240 degrees, like 240, 250 degrees. And so that's why with a boiling water canner, where we're, um, we're um, immer immersing the jar of food into boiling water, uh, the highest that temperature can ever go is 212 degrees, which is the temperature of boiling water. Any water that's in that boiling vat is gonna be 212 degrees. It can't be any hotter, otherwise it would be a gas. So boiling water canners um, are not, it are not going to kill the spore, the botulinum spore that's in the jar. Um, and so what we need to do is we need to change one of those other factors. And so what we do is we make sure that the food that is in a jar that we use a boiling water canner for um, is an acidic food. And so that's why we have two different ways of canning. Um, with acidic foods, we can use the boiling water canner. The temperature is 212 degrees, will kill almost everything except for botulinum spores but they're being controlled with acidity. Uh, with low acid foods, where they won't be controlled with acidity, we have to bring that temperature up to 240 degrees. And the only way that we can do that is with high pressure. And so that's why we have a pressure canner. Um, and so the moral of this story, I'm happy to answer all kinds of questions and take uh, um, after that, uh, because that was a lot of science. But um, the moral of this story is when we're canning, acidity really is the key to safe canning. And so in canning, we have this, uh, here's a pH scale, whereas uh, 4.6 for us is going to be the determining pH. Anything um, with the pH number being lower, which be, would mean that the, it has a higher acidity. Things like uh, uh, most fruits, fruits that taste sour to you um, are gonna be considered high acid foods. And those are gonna be safe for water bath canning. Things like pickles and things like tomatoes, um, we're really gonna to have to rely on an accurate, on a recipe that's gonna tell us that, that uh, what we're putting in the jar is acidic enough. And so um, with tomatoes, uh, they tend to kind of huffer at that 4.6 line. And so very often, um, or actually what is recommended is whenever you're canning tomatoes, you're gonna acidify them. So we're just going to put a little bit of citric acid or lemon juice or something in there just to make sure that those tomatoes are on the acidic side of that line. Um, and then things like carrots, um, potatoes, soups, beans, um, those are all gonna be considered low acid food. Even peppers, they, although they feel like spicy or hot, they're not considered acidic foods. Garlic, same thing, they're not considered acidic foods uh, even though they may give you some indigestion when you eat them, um, they're considered for the, for the sake of canning, they are low acid foods and we're gonna have to um, use recipes with those ingredients um, in pressure canner. Uh, so I'm gonna maybe just pause for a moment because I said all that really quickly, but um, were there any questions regarding that? That's like the most sciencey that I will be for tonight. So Carrie, we already have four questions. Do you Excellent. want to um, address them? So uh, Kira says, what kinds of things can you can? I know fruit and pickled things and sauces. Is yep. there anything else? Absolutely. Yeah, so, um, so for canning in the water bath canner, which are gonna be those like either already like acidic, naturally acidic foods or um, something like acidified, which means if you're doing something like salsa, where we're taking a tomato, which is kind of borderline, and then adding like onions and peppers to it, we're also going to add a bunch of vinegar or lime juice to balance that out. And there are recipes that are specifically meant for canning that has that, um, that like food chemistry already figured out. So, um, so foods that have been acidified, like chutneys, salsas, uh, marinara sauces, those types of things, um, I would consider, I would, I, would, I would recommend choosing a recipe that's specifically meant for canning for those. And I'm gonna give you a bunch of resources for finding. So pickles, fruit products, um, acidified tomato products, and other acidified food products 
um, as long as they're considered acidic, um, would be safe for water bath canning. Thanks so much. Um, and it says, will you have time to touch on updates or changes to guidelines like recent acceptance of STEAM? Ah, um, possibly, yes. I, I have been um, doing, I think my last, uh, yes. So specifically with STEAM canners, I think that there is a, um, a document, an article written by, um, so uh, Elizabeth and Andres, which uh, she's the, the food safety uh, specialist that, has, that, that does work with the University of Georgia Extension and the USDA. And I think it, in the last maybe uh, five or 10 years, she wrote an article specifically about steam canning. And I think that there are some details in there, although I can't remember them right now, but um, I can look up that article for you. Um, or if you want to, uh, yeah, I might have to come back on that one. Um, other details that I, I've been doing some research and, you know, people have been asking a lot about like pressure canning with Instapots and maybe, maybe I'll save that one for a little bit later. I have a lot to say about that, but I don't want to get derailed. Um, um, so Eva had asked in storing, I read to remove the ring, not like in the photo that mm -hmm. you had previously. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so let's see. So that's true. Um, and like this, uh, so here is like, I don't know if you can see me, um, but uh, it is true that when I, so the ring is on when we can, and then when the jars come out of the canner and they cool down and they cure, the ring is still on. But when I go to store my jars, I do remove the ring um, that gives me an opportunity to clean out uh, anything like gunk that might have product that might have spilled out during the canning process. And then I store without the ring. Um, and I do that um, because if there's anything going on in the jar where um, something didn't go right and there's like some, uh, you know, like off gassing or some something alive still in there um, and it will pop the seal, I want to be able to see that. Um, and sometimes leaving the ring on can like uh, hide hide a broken seal. So I do um, store without the ring on. Yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to get to mute. Okay, so the um, I have a two part question from Henry. He said, "What about jams? They aren't acidic. Can we can without a pressure canner?" And then the second part is, can botulism develop when the canned food moves into the danger zone of 40 to 240? Okay, so the first question is, um, jams should be considered acidic. So if they are, um, if it's like a, uh, most fruits are uh, on this pH scale considered acidic, there are a few that are not, um, and some tropical fruits, like, melon is not considered a fruit or is not considered acidic. So I wouldn't make a melon jam and can it, but I would make a strawberry jam and can it. Strawberries, kiwis, um, you know, apple, grapes. I think that um, sometimes blueberries in, in pectin recipes, they may add, have you add a little bit of lemon juice. I know if, like figs, um, well, they, they kind of run on that, um, kind of uh, midline as well. And so whenever you see like a recipe for fig jam or fig syrup, they'll have you add lemon juice too. So, um, you know, if, if there are any doubts, I think um, when I, when I uh, get to a little bit later, I'll show you some resources. Uh, my very favorite resource is the National Center for Home Food Preservation. Um, they have free online recipes and lots of um, information about canning. And so um, I'm actually, uh, if there's some time, I'll actually show you the website and kind of scoot you around the website a little bit, because that's gonna be the, the USDA like official guidelines for safety preservation. So I'll show you all that. And then what was the second part of the question? Um, well, another one he, following up in the jam is how can you tell if a recipe is good or enough acid processed right. long enough? Okay, so I'll show you great places to find recipes. Um, 
And then there was something else about the danger zone. Um, can botulism develop when the canned food moves into the danger zone between 40 and 240? Okay, so um, the, what, what we're gonna be doing, if we're pressure canning, what we're doing is we're gonna be like creating a hot food product, putting it in a hot jar, putting it straight into the canner and bringing the pressure up. So that it's, not, uh, it's not like your jar is gonna be hanging around while it's getting up to temperature. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it should be a, a fairly straightforward process. Um, and then as, yeah, and then once it's, it's finished processing and the can and the jar cools down, then it should be canned. So um, it should, you can store it at room temperature. I don't know if that answers that question. So a couple more that have come in. Is it necessary yeah. to turn your jars upside down when storing? Hmm. Uh, I'm gonna, let's see, I'm gonna stop my, I'm gonna stop my share just really quickly. I'm gonna see if I can see um, some folks. Um, can you repeat that question? Certainly. Is it necessary to turn your jars upside down in storage? Um, if your jar is uh, full of food, I would not recommend storing it upside down. I would store it right side up. Yeah, and especially because what, um, the, especially with acidic foods, what's gonna happen is that, um, that acidic food is going to be touching, is gonna be in constant contact with the lid, which is made of metal and will eventually deteriorate. And so I definitely wouldn't recommend doing that. It also potentially, um, again, if there was anything going on in there that would pop the seal, um, storing it upside down. Um, if it did pop the seal, you might have a mess on your hands. Um, if it doesn't, it, it also could hide the pop seal. So I store, um, and I also recommend storing just in one layer, um, not like this, but like this, um, right side up. How can you tell if your canned goods have gone bad? Ha ha. Um, I have lots of answers to that question. Um, one is, uh, as far as botulism goes, it, uh, botulism is a, like a, the, uh, will, will not necessarily um, off gas have any flavor, have any smell. And so um, as far as, food safety with, with botulism is concerned, it may not have a tell. Um, with other things, like if there are uh, like molds or yeasts um, that are gonna be causing like, uh, a, you might see like a visible mold. If you follow like a recipe that's meant for canning and follow all the instructions correctly, you shouldn't like, you shouldn't have botulism, you shouldn't have mold appear, you shouldn't have fermentation happening. Like it just shouldn't, all of the recommendations that um, your recipe will tell you is meant to keep those things from happening. And so the only thing that I would say is like, um, often food products are uh, considered like good stored up to a year. Um, what that means is that the quality of the food might deteriorate and especially like low sugar jams Sometimes even within months, you might see just the color change and because sugar actually uh, is, is really helpful in, it, it has its own preservation technique. So low sugar jams tend to like discolor really quickly. So you might see like the quality and the stability of the food, uh, uh, food product change or deteriorate after a while, but it's not gonna like suddenly become poisonous after a year. Um, so I, that was a lot of different um, questions there. Uh, I can take a few more questions and I can maybe move on. I just, I wanted to show you all some equipment and then show you some resources while we're here. So a quick question on pH. The chart reads from low acid to high acid, but mm -hmm. isn't uh, less acidic mean more alkaline? Yeah, yeah. And so in this, I'm gonna share my screen again. In this picture, it's uh, really just, uh, an in, infographic. Um, so, and basically what it's saying, whether you read right to left or left to right, what it's saying is one side is low acid. Um, and so you're right, when the acid, when the acidity is low, the pH is high. 
and when um, food is acidic, like the more acidic it is, the lower the pH number. So um, as we head this way, the numbers are gonna go down. And as we head this way, the numbers are gonna go up. Yeah, to, um, just to clarify that. And then last uh, question before you move on to equipment is in the water baths, do we need to boil our jars and our lids first? Haha. -ha. So that is a good question and also a good segue to um, talk about water bath canning. But um, so recommendations for it, it used to be um, that the, to answer the question specifically about lids, it used to be that you would pre-warm your lids because what that would do is like heat up this um, sealing compound. And I think because they're pouring that sealing compound thinner and thinner, or it's made out of different stuff, um, the manufacturer no longer recommends uh, pre-warming or pre-boiling your lids. So I pull them straight out of the box or uh, uh, off the new jars. I wash them first, but I'm not going to pre-boil them. As for jars go, if you are, if the processing time in your recipe is less than 10 minutes, like with some jam recipes, it says process five minutes. Um, if your recipe processing time is less than 10 minutes, then it is recommended to sterilize your jars. And what that means is like in boiling water for 10 minutes, that's how your jar is sterilized. If you're processing 10 minutes or more, or if you're pressure canning, then the jar is going to get sterilized with everything else during the it, during the process. So you don't have to do that. I would just start with very clean, very hot jars. And I did see there was a question about uh, that maybe was a clarification question about the jam when I said that uh, low sugar jams tend to discolor. And um, I it doesn't mean that the jam is like bad, like you're gonna get sick, but it may taste different and it may be less attractive. So it's a quality issue and not necessarily like a safety issue, if that clarifies or if that answers the question. Um, so I think that was the rest of my slideshow. And mostly just, um, so, I've got the water bath canning. And um, again, just to clarify, and I'll show you um, the tools that I have, but with water bath canning, we're gonna use uh, a large pot with a, with a lid and a rack. Um, and then we'll use uh, the jars, I'll show you the jars. But this method water bath is really, again, just to reiterate is for acidic foods and acidified foods, specifically fruit and fruit products, acidified tomatoes, pickles, relishes, chutneys, that type of thing. And then, the pressure canner, you're gonna need a special device that's called a pressure canner. Um, it comes with either a dial gauge or a rocker gauge, we'll see that. And, um, and this is what you would need to use if you wanted to do um, uh, vegetables without pickling them, beans, meats, fish, soups, um, and that type of thing. Um, and the recipes for, for pressure canning soups are not gonna have any um, fats or thickeners in them. Um, because that's gonna, uh, it's not recommended to use those. And let's see, okay, I'm gonna stop sharing again. And maybe I'm gonna, I'm going to, I'm gonna switch my camera. I have a, a another camera that just does a farther back version. Um, okay. And I'm gonna move back here, so. Can you all see me in this farther back version? I'm gonna move my chair back. Good. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, I have, I'm just going to show you the equipment that I use. So these, uh, when we, when we say canning, what we really mean is jarring, I guess, or jarring or bottling. Um, Cause we're not using like metal cans, but we're using these glass jars and they come in a bunch of different sizes. Um, and uh, they come, so this is they, the different size jars usually come like kind of two standard size lids. There's a, um, this is called the regular mouth and this is called uh, the uh, wide mouth. And, um, and they will come with a two piece lid. So this is, uh, so 
done. I'm just painting my video so I can see what you see. So this is a, um, it's called a mason style jar with a two piece lid. And these are reusable over and over again. The lids or the rings are re reusable over and over again, but these lids are guaranteed by the manufacturer to just seal once. And so um, you can buy just the lids um, in a box. And I usually, so what I do usually is I will label my jars on the top. And so I know that if it's labeled on the top, that means I've already used it once for canning. Um, and then I also will use, we'll need a canner. So water bath canner in, this is a, this is a large one. Um, this is a, a really large canner and it, um, this, this style comes with this, it comes with a rack here. This, this basically is just to keep the jars from touching the bottom of the pot. Um, you can use something else. Like I, this is a really large canner and it takes a lot of water to heat up and I don't, my, my family is pretty small and so I don't can a lot of things in like the quart size. I can a lot of things in this um, uh, half pint size. And so what I actually use for my canner is a stock pot um, and it has a lid. And then I just, um, I bought a rack that fits in there and you can use um, other things. I see people make racks out of stuff. I've even, um, like this is just my soup pot. And I, if I wanted to, um, like I've even just used this like steamer basket. I've seen people like, you might want to uh, smush it down to make it flat, but you can make a rack out of anything. Um, the key is that the pot itself has to be big enough that wherever the jar sits on the rack it needs to have, like, this doesn't fit in here, right? Even this one doesn't really fit. It needs to be able to sit on the rack and still have an inch of, uh, inch of space above it because you're gonna have, uh, the jars need to be submerged uh, underneath the boiling water by like an inch and then room to boil. So um, this is just my soup pot. I could get away with canning a really small batch if I was just doing like three of these little minis. This is like uh, something that I would use for canning like very specialty products like uh, pepper jelly or like a really spicy chutney or something like that where like this is enough, just like this tiny little bit. Or like individual size servings of applesauce for my children. It's a lot of work for individual size applesauce. I'm just gonna tell you that. Um, so you can use any kind of like large vessel with a rack and a lid, um, as long as it's big enough that you, your jars can kind of fit on the rack and still have an inch above it with room to boil. Uh, other equipment that I find really helpful for canning is this is a jar funnel. And this is really meant for like being able to put stuff, get your stuff in all the jars without um, getting gooey here. Um, and then a jar lifter. And so this is um, the black part is the handle and then the roundiest part is what And so these are really the two things that I find the most helpful besides the canner. Um, whatever food products you're making, especially for water bath canning, because it's gonna be acidic. Um, I like to use stainless steel or a non-reactive metal. So if I'm, this is my jam pot, I'm making jam in here. I'm not gonna be using like cast iron to make my um, jam or my tomato sauce. I'm gonna be use a non-reactive metal, um, non-reactive metal or wooden spoons, those types of things. Yeah. I, um, because of the short format of this, uh, this workshop, I decided to not go through like a canning demo, but I will show you, I'm gonna show you my pressure canner and talk a little bit about it, but then I'm gonna show you um, some places to get some really good resources. If you haven't canned before and you wanna take a peek at the process, um, I'll show you uh, my favorite resources. So we'll do that too. Okay. Um, this, this is my pressure canner. 
Um, there are different types. Brands that you most often see, this is called All American. They're also like Presto is another pretty common brand for pressure canner. And um, it's a it's a kind of a pretty big deal because this is gonna have to hold a lot of pressure. Um, and so, let's see. So two things that you'll see with the uh, pressure canners is that they'll either have a dial gauge or they'll have a rocker gauge. The All-Americans have both, which is why uh, it's my choice. If, you were, if I was to recommend something, I would choose this one because it has both. If, you're, uh, if you have a pressure canner with a dial gauge, you do need to have it tested every year for accuracy. Um, and then again, uh, there's gonna be inside here, there's gonna be a rack. Maybe you throw it something like this. And um, because with the pressure canner, uh, what's doing the heating up is not water, it's actually it's steam. It's, uh, so you're not going to be filling this with water. There's just gonna be a, a, you know, a couple inches at the bottom which means you can actually stack your jars. So some, like this is a really big canner, it actually comes with two racks. So if I'm doing like, uh, I can actually stack my pints too on top of each other with a second rack in there. So um, it's a different style of canning. If you are interested in pressure canning and you haven't done it before, um, I'm, I think my next step after I pause for more questions is to, um, to take you on a tour of the National Center for Home Food Preservation website. So I'm, it looks like there's, okay. It looks like there's a lot of questions popping up. So I am going to see, switch my camera back to me again. Maybe, oops, that's what that was. Sorry, I didn't mean to get you guys seasick. And I'll pause maybe and just um, remove my pin and say, how's it going out there in the chat world? I see a lot of chats, so a lot of questions popping up that I wasn't able to answer. Um, so I'll try to go in order for you, Carrie. Okay. Um, Kathy said she inherited an older, lovely avocado green canner. She has a new gauge and seal do you think it's okay to use with its advanced age? Um, yeah, I think as long as it's, um, so the, the, the seal, what was the thing that you said? It has a new dial gauge and a new seal, right? Um, and then there's another, um, another like rubbery piece uh, sometimes um, that's like the, if there's any other piece like a, that may, mine has like a, um, like a little a black thing, but basically it's like the, the thing that like the, the fuse that like blows off if the, if something goes wrong and the pet cock is the valve, clogged. the valve, thanks. Yeah. It, it'll blow it off basically, but you want that to be like relatively new too. Like it, if it's rubber, you want it to be still supple and not like a hard plastic. Um, but if all of those pieces are new, then it, you know, the, the integrity of the pot should be fine. Yeah. Great. And are you going to talk about where to get gauges tested or can mm. you miss that now? I can. Yeah. Um, I haven't gotten a, a pressure gauge tested in a long time, but I do know um, you can, if you, you can check in with, so King County um, Cooperative Extension may have more information, updated information. Uh, the county extensions used to have uh, all have like master food preserver programs and um, like uh, food safety hotlines. And, and last I know King County hasn't had that for a while, but there were like a couple of volunteers that were uh, man manning a food safety hotline and they may have more updated information, but um, McClendon's hardware actually is the last place that I know that does uh, test dial gauges. And so I would, um, I would check in with McClendon's and I would call ahead. And there's, I feel like there's several in this, like South King County area. I know there's like uh, one in Renton, one in White Center. Uh, I know there's one in Tacoma. There may be some, somebody in between there, but um, Sumner. McClendon's is a- Sumner's our closest. Okay, great, yeah. 
So um, call them and see, because I a few years back when before I got my All American, when I was trying to get um, this old Presto that I had uh, the dial gauge tested, McClendon's was the place that was able to do it for me. Great. Um, so, uh, can you sterilize your jars and lids in the dishwasher? Mm -hmm. I want to say no. Um, the dishwasher will definitely get your jars clean and can keep them hot. But I don't know that it would actually be considered a sterilization. And so, um, honestly, what I do is I put like, when I put my water bath canner on, I preheat my water in the canner and I put my jars in there um, to preheat my jars. And if I need to, and so that's how I preheat my jars. And then if I do need to sterilize, I just bring it up to a boil and let it boil like while I'm making my jam or while I'm like preparing my, you know, my food products that I'm going to can. So I think the easiest way to do it is to just boil them in your canner while you're preparing your food products. One mentioned there's a sterilization function, but I think that anyone that would be using detergent in their dishwasher probably doesn't want to use that. Even residual detergent can be um, still in the dishwasher, unless yeah. you, you think otherwise, Carrie, but. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know a lot about dishwashers, but um, even so the ones that have I don't want my yeah. jelly to taste like soap. <laughs> right, right. The hand washing. Yeah. My, uh, what, what I have been told, my understanding is that even if it has a sterilizing function, it's not the same as like, as boiling in water for 10 minutes. Um, how full do you fill your jars when you're canning? Ah, that's a good question. So in, um, in your recipes that are meant for canning, what they're going to do is they're going to um, tell you to fill your jar and leave a certain amount of headspace. So what that headspace is, it's going to be like uh, maybe if they might say like a quarter of an inch or a half an inch with pressure canning very often it's a full inch, but that's the space that you leave between the top of your food and the top of your jar. And that's actually really important. Like you can't just put two inches of food in a jar and then can it because that is what makes the vacuum seal happen. Um, like the food has to be up to a certain level so that that vacuum seal can, will happen and will work. But your recipe should tell you what that headspace specifically is gonna be. So speaking of recipes, um, for, low, for canning low acidic foods like tomatoes, is there a rule of thumb for how much acidic liquid to add so that the whole product is acidic enough to can? Like how much lemon juice or vinegar do you add for a specific amount of vegetables? Yeah. Um, and that actually, um, that is a good opportunity for me to just, um, I'm going to take a pause from the questions while answering this specific question um, and show you some resources just before we get to seven in case people need to leave at seven. I'm happy to stay and continue um, answering more questions after that. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen again. Um, I'm going to actually get out of this slideshow. I'm going to... Um, Actually, sorry. So I'm gonna talk about resources. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen again. <laughs> um, and this is my slide that shows my resources. Um, the handout that, gen oh geez, okay. Not what I wanted to The handout that, I'm just gonna go through these really quickly. I hope you don't get too sick. Um, the handout that question, uh, that um, Jeanette sent you has these same resources and, and, and maybe even a few more, but um, my very favorite resource is the National Center for Home Food Preservation. That website is run by the University of Georgia Extension, um, Cooperative Extension, and they do all of the recipe testing for the USDA's official guidelines for, food, for uh, safe food preservation. And, um, and so there is all kinds of information on that website for like the officially official safe way to do canning, uh, water bath canning, pressure canning, um, and then recipe like tons and tons of recipes for making like pretty classic things like dilly beans and pickled crab apples and 
um, mango chutney or whatever, like uh, they've got like pretty standard recipes um, and lots and lots of like how to can, like how to can potatoes, how to can, how to can bean soup, how to can pumpkins, how to can spaghetti sauce, all of that stuff. Um, they also, uh, on that website, you can buy So Easy to Preserve, which is a book, is like a hard copy book of a lot of those recipes and a lot of those methods. Um, and it's something like $14. It may be a little bit more now. Um, but I like to have this just like, uh, I like to look at books better than um, computers when I'm in my kitchen. It's just easier for me. So I like to have that. They also sell, um, have DVDs of like all of the videos that you can watch um, for how to do these things um, according to like the official guidelines. Um, Ball and other like, uh, Ball is, is a pretty standard um, uh, company for making, uh, they do the Ball Blue Book, which is classic. It's been around since forever. Um, I would say don't use your grandmother's version of it. Use a recent publication. And some people say 1995, some people say 2009, but like as, as we progress, um, uh, recommendations do keep changing. And so using um, at least something that's been made in the last few decades, uh, you know, get a, get a new one. If you're gonna buy a, a fall blue book, just get the one that they're selling now, the most recent one. It doesn't cost more than uh, $12, I think. Um, and then Ball also sells like, other um, like larger books that have a lot more recipes in them. If you want to do an online search for a recipe, um, I would add cooperative extension to the end of your Google search. Like if you're like, I want to find a recipe for uh, canning salsa, uh, just add like when you look for can like canning salsa in your Google search, add cooperative extension to the end because what that's going to give you is um, a recipe that has literally been tested in a laboratory to make sure that it's safe. And so with something like strawberry jam or like strawberries or strawberries, I'm not that concerned. Something like marinara sauce where we're adding, mixing low acid and, and like borderline acidic ingredients together, I'm gonna wanna make sure, or chutney, you know, where you're adding like onions and garlic, but also then vinegar. Like I wanna make sure that that recipe has been formulated to be safe. So um, that's when I get sort of um, make sure that we're using safe recipes. And then there are, yeah, there's tons of like, um, there's there's tons of information on the internet. And I just also wanna instill a little bit of wariness. Like if you go to YouTube and look for canning videos, you're gonna get like a lot of good stuff and then a lot of weird stuff and then a lot of bad stuff. So um, if you're gonna look for stuff like on the internet that is not necessarily like USDA or cooperative extension, Food in Jars is a blog that is um, run by a woman named Marissa McClellan. She's written like six books and she is like, uh, she's a canning nerd and a master food preserver. And so she like, she understands like what, and, and, and actually um, explains very clearly a lot of the science of like, what would make a recipe safe? What would make a recipe not safe? And so I completely trust um, her blog for finding recipes that are like, modern, both modern and fun, but also um, like completely safe. And so let's see, I'm going to, the last thing I wanna do is, I wanna take you to the National Center for Home Food Preservation website. Um, do, 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 if I'm able to, let's see. How do I get that bar to leave? Which one what were you? Oh, you know, I'm trying to get one of my tabs, but like the, when I put the, when I put my arrow up, it brings down that drop down bar. I'm going to stop oh. my share really quick. <laughs> it's a technical thing I haven't never, I have not figured out yet. Um, okay, I'm just going to move my tab and then re, reshare. Um, so this is the National Center for Home Food Preservation. It's not a very glamorous website. The recipes are not super modern, but um, especially if you just are starting or getting started and you haven't done canning before, I really recommend getting started here. They have, um, you know, this like, how do I can, freeze, dry, cure, smoke? 
Um, so I'm going to go to how do I can. Um, there's general information here. There's like to, just to get started, how to use your boiling water canner. On the handout that Jeanette sent you, there's just there's like a checklist of like here's the steps for doing your boiling water canner. But if you want more information, um, just you know click this hot link. It'll take you a lot of information about uh, what, who, why canning, and then like the steps to get you through. If you want to do pressure canning, I definitely recommend reading this um, beforehand because uh, pressure canning is something that there's there's a methodology that you have to you have to follow all of the steps um, you have to like vent the canner for 10 minutes and you have to like make sure that the you know there's all these things that you have to do and so it, I would recommend like reading through the information and then practicing in your pressure canner without any food product in your canner just practice like uh, bringing it up to pressure, venting the canner. Uh, oh yeah, like um, closing it up, venting the canner, bringing it up to pressure, uh, maintaining pressure, and then bringing it down. Just like practice doing that a couple times before you even put food product in there, um, because it is a complicated process anyway. So it takes a little bit of time. But as you go down here, you can see um, somebody asked a question about tomatoes and tomato products. So I will tell you that my favorite. Um, tomato recipe is this crushed tomatoes with no added liquid. But um, so I'm going to go to my recipe and we can take a look at it. Um, it looks like it's written more like a um, doesn't look like a regular recipe. Um, it's written more like a some like sort of scientific methodology, but. Uh, but like where it says here, quantity, an average of 22 pounds is needed per can or load of seven quarts. That doesn't mean you need 22 pounds of tomatoes to be able to, to can tomatoes. What it means is if you want to fill your canner, that's how much you need. But you can just do two cans or two jars. And what happens is um, uh, to uh, 10 minutes later, finally answer this person's question. Um, you go here and it says acidification directions. You click that button and what it tells you is you're adding for the size of your jar, you're gonna add lemon juice or citric acid directly to each jar. So it doesn't actually matter how many, how much um, tomatoes you're canning, you're gonna add, you're gonna acidify each jar with a, this like very specific amount that they're gonna give you. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you um, is in this recipe down below, this is the, this is what's going to um, be like the processing time. So it's gonna be, look like a chart. So if you're doing a hot pack for tomatoes, if you're doing pints, you're gonna process for 35 minutes. If you are at a higher altitude, you're gonna process a little bit longer. If you're doing in quarts, you're gonna process for 45 minutes. If you're at higher altitude, you're gonna go a little bit longer. If you're, this is for boiling water, Am I back? You're back. Sorry. Um, if you're if you're doing pressure canning, then uh, your processing time is going to be different. Um, it looks like it's less time to process to pressure can your tomatoes than it is to boiling water. But to actually get to that twenty minutes of processing time is a much longer thing. So, anyways, um, Carrie, someone asked if it was okay to run it longer. Can you? Yeah. Can longer you yeah yeah and for most things it's um yeah you can always you can process longer you just can't process shorter so like when i when i can my jam and the processing time is five minutes because i'm lazy to sterilize my jars i just process for 10 minutes and call it good but i wouldn't do the reverse like i wouldn't process less time it's okay to process more there are certain times where like if you're if you're if you're canning pickled cucumbers where like there's a very specific like texture and crunch that you want. If you process too long, it's going to change the the texture of your pickle, so it may not be desired. Um, like I wouldn't pressure or I wouldn't like process jam for a very very long time. But but um, going a little bit more is not going to change the safety of your product. Yeah. And since you brought up hot packing and cold packing, could you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah. 
Um, hot pack and cold pack is basically just um, the temperature of the food as it goes into the canner. So if I am, uh, like if I'm, if I'm canning berries, like blueberries, and I'll just like fill my jar with raw blueberries and then pour sy hot syrup over, um, that's because the berries were not cooked, they were cold, that's gonna be a cool jar of food going into the canner. And so the processing time might be a little bit longer. But if I had put, um, like if I, if I had like made the berries into a jam, because that whole product is boiling hot, that's considered a hot pack. It's really gonna change, like uh, with tomatoes, um, you'll see like if you have like tomato sauce that's all hot and it's a hot pack, your processing time might be like 30 minutes. If you put cold tomatoes in a jar and did that as a cold pack, it might take 85 minutes or something for your processing time because it, it takes that water, the boiling water has to bring, bring the temperature up of your food product all the way up. So um, sometimes a cold pack or a raw pack might um, be a longer processing time. And that's just kind of the difference of, it's the temperature of the food as in the jar as it goes into the canner. And then just to clarify, once the boiling process is done, um, do the jars need to be moved to the cooling rack right away? Or does this kind of go with the same time frame? a little bit longer doesn't hurt? Yeah, normally what happens once the processing time is done, I'll take the lid, I'll turn off the heat, take the lid off my canner, um, and then kind of let it sit for five minutes. And then I pull all of my jars out. Uh, there is, um, because I feel like some of this kind of went out of order as I was answering questions um, and didn't give you like a full uh, demonstration as well, start to finish. I think I do want to share with you that um, there are here at this website there, if you go to multimedia um, and videos, there are videos here that you can see. So you can actually, if you scroll down here, you can see, um, the boiling water canning process. And this is just like a two minute video. It'll take you to YouTube and you can see the process start to finish. It's very quick. Um, and so there are, uh, as I said, like on YouTube, there's a lot of bad information out there. And so even though like these videos are not super modern or very glamorous videos, um, they have really accurate information. So um, if you, here's a good place to start if like I didn't, because I didn't get to go through like a demo with you and have a clear start to finish of the process, um, go ahead and watch this video. And I think that that you'll have a, a little bit better, um, better idea of how it goes. All right, it's at five after seven right now. And I just want to check in, um, Jeanette and Amanda, um, do we want to go a little bit longer? I imagine that there's probably a ton more questions. Um, I'm happy to stay as long. I know the yeah. Instapot one is a is a definite that <laughs> wants to be discussed. So, uh, okay. Jeanette, what do you think? Yeah, I was just gonna say for everyone who needs to go, as long as you have registered with me, Jeanette, at the City of Federal Way, I will email out um, information as well as a link to the video. Um, so if you need to go, absolutely fine. Those of you who want to hang around, um, we are here and we'll go through questions. Do you want to keep recording, Amanda? Yeah, if you don't mind, Carrie, it'd be great for everybody that might have to leave. We're we're still live on Facebook too, and this will be up on the South King Tool Library's website, uh, Facebook, um, and eventually maybe the website. But okay. I'll let you take it away again. This is really informative. Thank you. You're getting a lot of kudos, of course, from, from the group too. So if you can't see oh, that. Oh, good. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I know like I went out of order of like how I would normally teach a canning class, but I just, I was trying to do like a bigger un umbrella view of things um, rather than the details. It's hard to avoid that. So we want to hear about Instapots. This is one of the most oh, common okay. questions. Oh my goodness. Okay, so here's what I know so far. Um, the, the Instapot doesn't, there is one model of Instapot that has a canning function. However, all of the folks that I know uh, do not recommend doing it because when you're, when you're pressure canning in a pressure canner, there's this process of like having to vent the canner for like 10 minutes. 
And then also after your processing time is done, you let the, um, the canner come back down to pressure on its own. And all of that is uh, included in the process. And with uh, like the electric, like um, the Instapot Max, I think, which is the one that has the canning function, it doesn't uh, take into those things into account. And so um, there are um, a couple articles I read. One is uh, Marissa McClellan Food and Jars blog actually has an article why she talks about how she doesn't recommend the Instapot Max for pressure canning. Um, I think it will probably be safe to do water bath canning in it. Um, I don't. I would. I don't think it would be safe. I don't think that the temperatures uh, that the the entire food product will reliably get up to the temperature needed um, consistently to make sure that your food product is safe for pressure canning. Um, the another chapter of the story that I just recently found out only a tiny bit is that Presto has created an electric pressure canner um, that supposedly has that has an auto function to like do that 10 minute vent and then also bring down um, to, to basically to follow the USDA guidelines for pressure canning. Although they haven't done, they either haven't done lab testing to support it or they haven't, they're not sharing their, um, you know, any of their like testing. So um, there isn't any, so the, the official word from the USDA and the University of Georgia Extension is that they, they can't recommend it because they don't have any like testing to support that uh, that the what the food product that's in the jar is consistently heated up to that temperature through that electronic process. Um, but that's the closest thing that we have. And so um, the Presto has started making an electric pressure canner with its own kind of like uh, instructions that come with it. And even though I don't I, I, I don't know enough, I'm not a food scientist, I don't know enough to say like absolutely recommend it, it's totally safe. Um, that's, keep an eye out for that and look for testing on that because that's the next thing that's gonna be coming down the pipe for that. But for the Instapot, I would say no. For any other regular like uh, pressure, pressure cooker uh, is not necessarily meant for canning, pressure canning. So that's my, that's my spiel about the pressure canner. You can use it to cook the things. That's what I love about the, yeah. you know, hands-offness with like plum plums. I have a plum tree. Throw them all in the oh, into yeah. pot and you got sure. the pan really quickly. So yeah, definitely Thanks. for sure for food preparation and even I don't know the details of it, but if you can figure it out to do like water bath canning, that's probably going to be fine. Because again, with the, the biggest concern for me is the botulinum. And so if if you're making an acidic food product, then you know the worst that's going to happen with water bath canning is like uh, you didn't get all the mold spores and it's going to start bubbling, and then you just know that you don't eat it and you throw that one away. If the seal pops or you see visible mold, the botulinum is the hardest one because it's invisible, it's tasteless, it doesn't have a smell, um, and that really is critical. That that's the that's that's critical with low acid foods. So as long as your food product is acidic enough to be water bath canned. I'm far less concerned about the safety of that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it's really pressure canning that I, I get really nervous about, making sure that people are following guidelines and following safe recipes. That was great. Um, speaking of the bubbly, somebody asked that they canned five jars of garlic dill pickles and they were cloudy and fizzy. Is Ooh, okay. Well, the cloudy could be depending on what kind of salt you use, depending on what kind of vinegar you use, like apple cider vinegar is naturally cloudy. If it was fizzy, then it means that something didn't go right in your process. And either what that means is either you didn't use a recipe that was meant for canning or you didn't follow the process correctly. Yeah, so if it's fizzy, I would not, yeah, I wouldn't, I would be nervous about eating it. I would not recommend eating it. Okay and a shelf life for preserved food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we, I, I've always said like up to a year, but I think that that's like a really subjective to the food product. Um, the new lids are saying that they guarantee a seal for at least 18 months. 
So at least you know that your jar is guaranteed to be stayed sealed for a year and a half. Um, it really comes down to like the um, what kind of food product is in there, and it's more about like the quality of the food product as opposed to the safety. Again, if it's been canned properly, it's going to be safe to eat. It just like if it's pickles, the vegetables are going to soften. The texture is going to be different. They might develop some off colors. This is a jar of uh, carrots that I pickled in 2013. It's still safe to eat, but it's like kind of army green. It's not, it doesn't look as cute as it once did. This is just for demonstration. I don't plan to eat this. I've just been carrying it around for a while. Um, so another question, are blanching and freezing low acid foods like corn, beans, and asparagus as safe as pressure canning? Um, can you say that again? You, and if the person who asked it wants to jump in, um, that's great too. Are blanching and freezing low acid foods like corn, beans, and asparagus just as safe as pressure canning? Um, yeah, so using freezing as a method of food preservation as opposed to pressure canning, I think it's actually safer. So um, pressure canning low acid foods, I think is probably the thing that I have the most nervousness around in food preservation at all, aside from like, I don't know, uh, fermenting case sausages, like that is also dangerous. But, um, but, but pressure canning low acid foods, I think it makes me the most nervous. So if you're just putting something in the, in the freezer, uh, totally safe. Yeah, totally safe. Wonderful. Um, with more GMOs out there, uh, does that make canning a challenge? Does it affect canning at all? Um, so GMOs, like genetically modified foods, genetically modified organisms, I don't know that it would necessarily uh, change any canning situation. I think it's just a personal decision on whether you choose to eat those foods or not. Um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, the, the, the GM, what I know of GMOs, like most of them are commodity foods. So they're going to be things like um, corn and soy and um, I mean, sugar beets, you know, like a lot of the, the big GMO crops are commodity crops. Like your backyard tomato is probably not going to be like a GM tomato. I think they experimented with some GM tomatoes and everyone decided it was a bad idea. Um, not everybody, but nobody liked that trout tomato or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know a lot about GMOs, but I, I can't imagine that it would change um, the, the canning safety. I know like with tomatoes, uh, it's not necessarily a GMO issue, but like as we are you know, there's like lots of different varieties of tomatoes. And as we are, our food preferences as Americans um, and, and as our technology shifts so that we can like have fresh tomatoes all year round, um, we like sweet flavored tomatoes. They're naturally gonna be less acidic. And so that's why like before the seventies, they didn't recommend acidifying tomatoes when you can them. Now they do. And it's because of a lot of varieties that we have are sweeter and less acidic, but that's, that's natural breeding. That's not like a genetic, uh, like a, a laboratory, like a GMO modification. That's sort of natural breeding selection. So um, another question is, is there anything you've canned that you were disappointed in as a canned product that mm. you wouldn't recommend canning? Yeah, uh, probably a lot of things. I, I think um, acidified tomato products like salsa, I am sort of always uh, a little disappointed with because with, to, with, uh, with salsa, when you're adding tomatoes and garlic and like peppers, you have to add so much vinegar or lime juice to counteract that to make it a, an acidic food um, that it doesn't taste good. Like it tastes weird. And so what I tend to do instead is just can my tomatoes, like just because cause then you use less, you're using less like citric acid or less lemon juice to acidify just the tomatoes. And then when I want to eat salsa, I use my canned tomatoes to make my salsa and I just make my salsa fresh. Or 
you know, and, and I think the same thing too with like spaghetti sauces, because you're adding like the onion and the garlic and the basil. Um, you have to add a lot more vinegar to like counteract that. So if you have like a very special marinara recipe, like don't, I wouldn't say try to can it. I just put it in the freezer, like make a big batch, put it in the freezer. Uh, you're going to be, you're going to, yeah. Those are, those are the things I think of most of those like acidified tomato food products um, that I prefer to just do my tomato straight and then make the make the spaghetti sauce afterwards or uh, make the salsa afterwards. Great. Um, so people want to hear about the story about the shelf of cans behind you, mm. like your backdrop. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, to be honest, a lot of this is dry goods. So it's, a lot of it is dried um, herbs and like, uh, and herbal products. So I have this jar of dried nettles, we're now harvested nettles. And then I do a lot of drying. I've also have like a, I was gifted a really stellar um, Excalibur dehydrator my mom gave me for my birthday. And so, um, I actually prefer to do a lot of drying and, and also freezing to an extent. Um, and then when I do canning, I do small batch canning. Like I'm just doing like this size or this size because that's what works for my family. Um, yeah, but yeah, this is my, uh, this, the story is, is that when Zoom had the pandemic happened and everyone had their Zoom meetings in front of their library, like their bookshelf, I was like, this is my bookshelf. So that's my, that's my Zoom backdrop. Way better than like the the grass ones in outer space. <laughs> oh, I, like it. I like outer space. Jeanette's at the beach. Oh yeah, Jeanette has a really good one, and that's a, a plug for uh, our next class too with dehydrating. Um, we and I, I, you know, spaced out the fact that the tool library actually does have vacuum sealers, which are really helpful for. Um, freezing things. And then we do have some commercial dehydrators as well to help with that process. We're working on getting more canning equipment that that the uh, $300 uh, uh, pressure cooker you have there might be really nice addition to the tool library, but hasn't come in yet as a donation, surprisingly. <laughs> I will check with my grant officer and see if we can purchase this uh, for checkout. So everybody stay, if you don't have a pressure canner, uh, stay tuned, follow the tool library, and uh, if I can get a grant to get one, we will do that. If anyone has one they want to donate, we can definitely replace seals and stuff too. Yeah, the thing about the All-American that's really nice is because it has a the rocker gauge, it's not as critical that the dial gets tested every year, and it doesn't have a rubber gasket. It has like a different way of sitting, so um, there's not a lot of things on it that need to constantly be like kept up with. That's why I recommend the All American. It's probably much more expensive than a Presto, but. There's a question um, about a glass stove top. Oh, yeah. that is a good question. Yeah, um, which I, uh, it's, yeah, it never, it wasn't as big of a deal before. Um, when I started canning, it was rare to have a glass top and now it's very common. And unless you have gas, like uh, everyone's got a glass top now. And I think um, I am still hesitant to can on my glass top. I, I would say um, to check with the manufacturer's instructions because I think that the, the quality of that glass top is very different. I think if you're doing uh, water bath canning for short periods of time and the, the base of your canner fits within that circle, you're probably okay. Um, but if you're gonna do any lo like long canning or if like the circle of the bottom of your canner is bigger, much bigger than the circle of your, um, the glass top. Um, and also for pressure canning, for some reason, I'm a little more nervous. Um, because it's usually a much longer period of time. Um, then what I do in my house is I have just like a, a tabletop butane burner that I, that I use for canning. It's like a, 
don't know, I got from the Asian grocery store. They're like $25. Um, or you can do it like on a Coleman stove or something. Um, but yeah, I, I still am a little nervous. I don't, I don't have updated information about the glass tops. If like nowadays they're making them where it's fine to can. If you have an induction top, then you have to make sure that you're, that the canner that you use is uh, stainless steel or is a um, is is fine for use with induction because a lot of them are like aluminum or the cast aluminum or um, uh, doesn't work with the with the induction. So that's another thing too that might come up. But yeah, I haven't figured out that glass top thing. I got to do more research on that too. Were there any other questions or any questions we missed? I think when I mute everybody, I'll, I'll unmute and we'll we'll pause Facebook Live. But thank every thank you everyone for your time. We're almost to seven thirty, so we'll just let for a few more minutes if anyone wants to unmute and say anything. But I'll pause um, that. Maybe I'm gonna uh, share screen.